Okay, hello everybody. Hello. We are going to go ahead and get started in just a minute. We're going to get started in just one minute. Just a couple of announcements before we do. As a reminder, if you plan to use the hotel shuttle, please let the hotel know about it at the front desk and schedule your trip if you plan to use the shuttle to the airport. Uh, announcement number two, I came up here without my list and I'm immediately blanking on announcement number two. No, okay, I got it. Announcement number two, we've gotten several questions about uh, conference materials. All of the PowerPoints from our presenters will be available on the conference website after the event and all of our attendees will get an email notifying them of that. Uh, in fact, if you're interested in materials from either of our two prior events, you can go see those materials there now. Uh, there's a little bit of a time lag because once we get the materials from our presenters, we put them through a 508 compliance process, but they'll all be available online for everyone to access. Okay, that's it for me for announcements. It is my pleasure once again to introduce Debbie Cox Roush, our director. So, welcome back, everyone. Have you had a good afternoon? Yeah. Did you learn a lot? Well, let me tell you what, I love these workshops, and usually I didn't get to attend as much this afternoon as I wanted to. There were some other things going on, but I like learning along with you and chatting about what you're learning, so I'm probably going to be asking some questions later because I didn't get to go to a couple, one of the workshops, and I really wanted to stop in. But I do get ideas about what we can be doing and other opportunities for engaging our volunteers, and that really helps me. Um, you know, I want to envision how our volunteers can become more engaged on this and other issues. It's the afternoon, so don't worry, I'm not going to stand up here and give a speech today. Um, somebody told me about 5 o'clock, it's 5 o'clock somewhere at 5 o'clock, so. <laughs> um, but this, t this session is titled, From Policy to Practice, Two Perspectives on the Opioid Crisis. The first perspe perspective is being presented by a man with whom I've been enamored since we met a couple years ago. <laughs> there you go, Bob at an Elder Justice Council meeting. At that meeting, I heard him discuss how the opioid cr crisis crosses over the elder justice space, and he made an impassioned plea for opioid funding to support people like you who are helping adults on the ground, at the county level, at the local level, and across the country. I was riveted by his speech. Even back then, I thought, gee, He'd be great at one of my convenings. Now he's been at almost all of them, and I'm happy. You know, I didn't know at that time, until we spoke after the meeting in all seriousness, that he was a fan of Senior Corps. So naturally, we became great allies, and he's been a good um, resource for me and a, a mentor as I come into this new space. And, you know, I've even learned more about him. So I'm going to tell you a story. His work on behalf of aging service programs is never ending and he's nationally and internationally recognized. He's executive director of the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Services Program, NANASP, I hope you guys can remember that, and serves on the national board of AARP. Bob serves on numerous boards, including being the immediate past chair of the board of the American Society on Aging, on the board of the National Council on Aging, and of the advisory panel on outreach and education of the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. In 2016, he was selected by Next Avenue as, the one, as one of 50 influencers in aging. And the little known fact, some of you that were at the last convening will probably remember this, that I just love to tell is he is the recipient of the title Knight of the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic the highest ranking honor awarded for merit in public service and humanitarian activities. Because of that, we sometimes refer to him as Sir Bob, <laughs> which we say with much admiration and respect. So let me present to you my friend, our friend, Sir Bob Blancato. taking that line about enamored home with me. Tell my wife, it's just not, it's just not her, you know. So, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, 
before I make a couple of comments, I'm going to, be, I'm going to make, start with a confession. You see that first slide? I have no idea what that is, okay? <laughs> now, how many people in this room give speeches periodically and do PowerPoints, right? Have you noticed that new feature they have? If you look to the right before you start, you know, they have all these diagrams or pictures and stuff, you know? So I decided at random just to pick one. <laughs> and there it is. I have no idea what it is. If somebody has it, knows what it is, at the end of the speech, you come up and tell me. But I thought it was very pretty, and there it is. All right, am I going the wrong way here? Yep, all right, where's the forward? This must be the forward button. All right, whoop. Okay. All right, so, first of all, Debbie says very nice things about me, but you have to understand, um, I do spend a lot of time in the national's perspective on aging policy, volunteer work and stuff. You know, in a very short time, she's a rock star, right? She has made her presence felt. You know, a lot of people try to do that, but not that many people succeed. She does it by hard work. She does it by being close to you. That's really important. There's some people who get appointments who never have a connection with the people that they represent. You don't have that issue with her. So I'm delighted that's, you know, that's the case. And I'm going to make another confession, too. I brought my wrong glasses up here, so hang on a second. Jan Newsom, I, I haven't seen Jan yet, but I, she, is she here, Debbie? No, Jan's not here? Okay, but she's my good friend, and, uh, and Brian for his hard work. And uh, so, you know, I really like participating in your conferences for the same reason I like working in the field of aging and, the, and human services, because of the ability to work directly with people who work on behalf of other people. And, you know, I've had opportunities here to, with great dialogue that happened in a room, happened in the hallway. Um, and all I can say is that we need to publicize more about Senior Corps, even more than we do. Okay? That's our job, my job. People who are not in the program need to be out pr publicizing the program more than we do. So the title of this thing is Senior Corps Respond, Senior Corps in the Opioid Epi Ep Epidemic, Mental Health and Substance as They Relate to Older Adults. So I, um, as Debbie mentioned, I am the National Coordinator of the Bipartisan Elder Justice Coalition. I don't know if anybody knows that group, but it's a national organization dealing with preventing and helping to fight elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And in that capacity, there are two facets of elder abuse that seem to affect the entire country. Let's do the audience thing now. How many people in this room got a robocall in the last three days? Raise your hand. How many got one in the last three minutes? Raise your hand. <laughs> but true story, a senator from New Jersey was holding a press conference to announce with great fanfare, a new bill he was introducing on behalf of fighting robocalls. And in the middle of the press conference, he got a robocall. So you see, it happens to everybody, right? The second thing, of course, is the opioid crisis, and as Debbie mentioned, the relationship between elder abuse and the misuse of op opioids. And how bad is this crisis? Some of these statistics, some of them you know, some of them may not know. 130 people a day die from overdosing on opioids. Fatalities totaled more than 47,000 just in the year 2017. More opi Americans die from opioid abuse than motor vehicle accidents in this country. And then the economic burden, according to the Centers for Disease Control, is that the total burden is about $78 billion a year, including health, co health care costs, lost productivity, addiction treatment, and criminal justice involvement. And just last year, HHS declared the opioid crisis a nationwide public health emergency. And then for statistics, and, you know, I'm not sure how well that shows up on the screen, but, you know, the, the uh, higher, darker numbers are where the highest rates of deaths are occurring in opioids. But, you know, there's very, very few places where there's not some degree of impact going on on the topic. I'll hold that up for one second, because in case you, you know, how many, I'm not sure how many states are represented here, but you probably see yours there. And, you know, it's, it's disturbing, you know, because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a major uh, problem across the country. With respect to older adults, according to, again, to HHS, Medicare beneficiaries are the fastest growing population with diagnosed opioid use disorder. Okay? Medicare, the Medicare program. The Medicare program that made 
life so much better for older adults, okay, when it was established in 1965. And then now we find beneficiaries being among the fastest growing populations with opioid use disorder. SAMHSA, which is the long name for the, health, the Substance Abuse Agency in, in Washington, reported that opioid abuse doubled among Americans 50 and over between 2002 and 2014. Now keep in mind, as you know, the demographics of this country are this country is aging, right? I mean, how many people in this room are baby boomers, by the way? Raise your hand. And how many of you are in denial about aging? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Well, you can't deny the demographics. They are there. And, you know, the, one of the most interesting demographics that I find, the two fastest growing groups of people in the older population, 85 and over, and minority older adults. And in the case of minority older adults, there'll be a doubling of them by the year 2030. Reader's Digest in April did, released a survey of more than 1,200 adults over age 50 and found that 40% take leftover opioids for conditions that drugs were not prescribed for. I sat through a meeting, that same advisory panel you talked about, I was, at the, I was in my final meeting of that group yesterday in Washington, four years, and we were discussing the whole issue of these take-back campaigns to get these drugs out of the house, these old drugs before they become harmful, before they get misused. And it's amazing how many people have stored medicines, you know, in their, in their homes for years and years and years. According to a recent blog from the American Society on Aging, rural older adults are more likely than urban to find themselves raising grandchildren because of an adult parent or a child is addicted to opioids. And I know there was some discussion about grandparents earlier today. And the obvious factors leading to older adult victimization, they, most freq they more frequently experience pain related to acute illness or injury, live with one or more chronic conditions associated with pain, and there's a glaring lack of screening for older adults vulnerable to abuse. In fact, one of the people at this meeting yesterday, a physician, we were talking about chronic conditions. She said, you know, she sees older adults in her business. She said, I have yet to see any of my patients with only one chronic condition. They're averaging three and four, okay? This is what we're dealing with in reality. Now, when you get to mental health by the numbers, the American Psychological Association estimates the number of older adults with mental or behavioral health problems will quadruple from four million in 1970 to 15 million in 2030. That's a big number, that's a big factor. And again, related to chronic disease, there's a growing connection to depression, especially if there's more than one chronic condition being dealt with. APA also estimates that 20% of those 55 plus suffer from some mental disorder. And two thirds of those in nursing homes exhibit mental and behavioral issues, yet only 3%, look at that last number, only 3% of older adults report seeing a mental health professional. Now some of that is their fault, some of that's the system's fault. Because what is one thing we are lacking in this country? The adequate number of people in healthcare who care for older adults. We have shortages of physicians and nurses and all kinds of people in the medical world to take care of this growing older population. And this statistic bears out what we need to do more. So what is our response as we look at this growing crisis? Well, you know, it's not enough, it's never enough okay, when you're dealing with a crisis. But at least with the opioid crisis, there is some sustained response going from Congress and the administration. Most notably, the Support Act of 2018, which passed, which directs resources into communities to promote opioid recovery and treatment programs for patients. We are awaiting final action on a spending bill in Washington. For those of you who follow, you know, I mean, uh, all right, here's, here's another audience question for you. I, I hope I don't get in trouble for this one, Debbie, but I'll try it anyway. How many people in this room have either shaken their head or their fist at Washington in the past year? <laughs> ra ra raise your hand. There are reasons for that, folks. There's reasons for that. For those of us who work in the policy arena and we expect certain things to happen on certain schedules, like the fiscal year end, September 30th, you can't do anything about that at the federal level, right? So October 1st, you're hoping that your agency has its budget so you can do your work, right? But that's not the way things get done in Washington too often. But we all have, you know, hope springs eternal, even in Washington. So we have this spending bill that has passed the House of Representatives that will, among other things, provide a new $2 million allocation to address screening for opioid-linked elder abuse, which grew out of, directly out of, Debbie, the EJCC meeting, because we made that pitch there. $115 million in increased funding for the Substance Abuse Unit at HHS and related agencies, and a very important program in this space, 
the Social Services Block Grant. I'm not sure if any of you get money from the Social Services Block Grant, but it was proposed to be eliminated in the budget that came out early in the year, but the Congress has restored the funds and may even provide an increase for it. Now, in mental health policy, you know, we are really slow in catching up to the realities of mental health issues in, in, in Washington. But just to prove sometimes the old, that there, is, there are exceptions to the rule, you hear about Washington, the fighting, right? And the partisanship and the bickering and the division, okay? Well, you know, every once in a while, either when something is so significant that it requires action, or you get the right people coming together on the Democratic and Republican side, and they'll pass a bill for the purpose of benefiting the whole country. Such a bill was the Cures Act, the 21st Century Cures Act, which passed in the previous Congress. And among its more important provisions was the creation of a new Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use in the Department of Health and Human Services, the development of a mental health strategic plan. Now, why is that important? Because we have one for Alzheimer's disease that was passed as another piece of legislation. We've got to come to a realization, we've got to put this thing out for a planning process. Okay, you've got to get people engaged in buying into a strategic plan for fixing a situation. Improvement of community crisis response systems and evidence-based practices for older adults in the mental health area. These are all provisions in the 21st Century Cures Act, which came out of Congress on a bipartisan basis. Then we have the Affordable Care Act and mental health. Now, you know, after everybody thought the Affordable Care Act was out of the woods and was going to stay and keep uh, being the law of the land, we have a pending court case, a significant pending court case, that if they rule a certain way, they could rule the entire Affordable Care Act unconstitutional. And I don't know what comes after that, okay? And I don't, I'm not a predictor, okay? When it comes to courts especially, I don't know how to predict what courts do. But let's assume that we can keep the Affordable Care Act, or flip it over. If you're concerned about this, what would go if that court said you're out the door? The inclusion of mental health and substance abuse benefits as essential health benefits, one of the most important provisions in the Affordable Care Act. What is an essential health benefit? The application of mental health parity protections to the individual and small group markets. There must be comparable coverage as, as there would be in medical and surgical care. Mental health parity, major, major issue that, again, on a bipartisan basis has been pushed by Washington. The preventative screenings. You know, going back to the baby boomers for a second, what is the one thing we know about the boomers? They're getting older too, right? They started to turn 65 a number of years ago. Well, guess what happened? The boomer impact is being felt in Medicare. And I'll give you this one statistic, which is not up here, so, which means you have to think about it and write it down, because I don't have it up on the screen, folks. But here's the statistic for you. Medicare, in the past 10 years, has added more preventative benefits to its programs than it had in the previous 40 years. What is that about? Boomers. Boomers don't want the same Medicare that they started from before. They, want a, they don't want a Medicare that just helps you when you get sick and cover hospital costs. They want to put the money up front and prevent disease and illness. Things like depression screenings and without co-pays, which is very important. Because the money you pay, save up front, down the road, you'll spend a lot less in Medicare and Medicaid if you invest in prevention. And the important protections for those with pre-existing conditions. You hear about that a lot. That's been a big issue. That includes mental illness. So there is a lot at stake in keeping these parts of the Affordable Care Act going. And let's hope that stays. The administration's response beyond that and the opioid situation has been significant. They appointed a general, gentleman named Admiral Girard to coordinate the federal response from the Department of Health and Human Services. And we had the opportunity to meet with him. In fact, Lance was here earlier today, right? I saw him in the airport. He was coming to security and I was coming out. We had a meeting with Admiral Girard to make the point we made at the Elder Justice Coordinating Council. If these billions of dollars are coming in to deal with the opioid crisis, some of it must go to entities like Adult Protective Services, service providers who deal with older people every day. You know, it shouldn't just be out there without some connection to what's going on in the real world. And, you know, this has led to a number of very important partnerships inside HHS, all those different agents with all those alphabet soup names there, ACL and CMS and so on and so forth. But coordination is an important thing, by the way. 
You know, for those of you who are, and everybody is a fiscally responsible individual to start with in life, right? Things change as time goes on. But one thing you should always say, coordination saves money. We have this Elder Justice Coordinating Council that Debbie's a key member of. That came out of a law we helped pass about nine years ago. You know what that was all about? You have no idea how many federal agencies are dealing with elder abuse in this country. Something like 13 or 14 di different agencies doing different things. But guess what? They never talk to each other. They don't know one is do what one is doing over here and the other one is doing over here. Well, guess what? If you put them together, put together a plan that's going to show how to make that coordination work better, you will save money and use the existing money you have in a much wiser way. Same thing with this opioid situation. But as I learned from doing some research, every once in a while people like me do research before they come give speeches. You see, it's good for everything. I said, you know, who's standing out in this space? And guess what? You guys are. Okay, and I have some things to show. The $27 million the Corporation for National has invested in opioid and substance abuse related AmeriCorps and Senior Corps projects over the past two years. Invested, okay? Not expended, invested. There's a very important distinction between those two words, okay? You know, anybody can spend money, but how, it's what you're spending the money for and what will it produce that you should focus on. That's an investment, a good solid investment. Senior Corps investing almost $500,000 in RSVP expansion grants with a focus on drug take back programs. You know what? After what I learned yesterday and, and talking to this in the CMS meeting yesterday, we need to do a lot more of that, but we got to do it right. There got to be the right people at the table helping in those take back programs. But when they're done right, you'd be amazed how the, the, the word travels. And you'll get take up rates that are unbelievable on the part of people. Then you had 52 Senior Corps projects in 25 states beyond this taking part in drug take back activities. And then in Tennessee, you're having RSVP volunteers deliver drug education materials to military veterans. These are good, tangible, reportable things back which make a huge difference to people in Washington, particularly in Congress, particularly those people who give out money, okay? They love tangible results and you're producing them. And in the state of Ohio, there's some wonderful work going on here. The distribution of over 1,000 drug disposal bags by RSVP volunteers in Perry County. If anybody, if I'm, if I'm pulling anybody's name out of our program, clap, will you? Is that you? Are you in the back? That's you guys? Okay, good. <laughs> Education and training for 1,000 people with Bowling State University on red flags that might indicate an older adult is struggling with opioid addiction. The Area Agency on Aging of Northwest Ohio. Are they here? Anybody here? Okay, let's clap for them anyway. Come on, they did a good job. And I just learned, I just had this repeated to me when I was sitting in the room before, the work in Lake County on this very important kinship care program, which developed free seminars for grandparents raising grandchildren on how to access resources. You cannot do enough of that work. In 1995, I had the pleasure of running the White House Conference on Aging for President Clinton. We do these every 10 years. We just introduced that topic as a policy issue back in 1995. And I remember how it got introduced. I remember we were doing a forum. We did forums all around the country. And I went to one in Cupertino, California. And I was, I was late for the event. And I walked into the room. And you could cut the tension with a knife. Because on stage were three sets of grandparents who were raising their grandchildren. And they were telling the story of how they found themselves in that situation. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking imprisonment, abandonment, all the things that you can think of. But what stood out the tallest was the fact that they took that role on willingly with love and care. But our laws were not giving them the same rights and privileges as parents. We're making great strides in that area. And why are we making great strides? Because over four million grandchildren are being cared for by their grandparents in this country. That's an amazing number. But we've got to be responsive to them. And there's all, more activities I know that you're doing. But here's what it comes down to. It's about trust. It really is about trust. All this activity that you're doing, the things I cited, the things I didn't get around to citing, proves that the closer you are to the ground, to the individual, the more effective you will be, especially when it comes to raising awareness, which is so critical in this discussion, in this, in this space. Proactive prevention related to addiction and substance abuse and mental health. But to get to people, to get to people, you must be a trusted entity or be affiliated with one. Am I right? That's a key piece. Sometimes you don't even appreciate that as much as you should. 
being a trusted entity for these kinds of activities. And that's the first big step, is to have that trust built in. And I know that you have a can-do mentality in volunteers and the trust that make you so effective. And it's also about experience to go along with the trust. I asked Jan, you know, and she was surprised. She said, Bob, you want these numbers? I said, yes, I want to get my feel around this thing. I want to see the issues like how, what's the average age of an RSVP volunteer? 74. And other two programs average age 72. Okay? You know, I used to work for the House Committee on Aging many years ago. We had a, cha a, a, a chairman named Claude Pepper who was from Florida. And Brian, let me know how I'm doing, will you, you know, time-wise. Claude Pepper was 75 years old when he became the chairman of the House Committee on Aging. And I was 27, 28, time, you know, being an advocate, a staff person. You know, the first issue we took on was ending mandatory retirement at 65, which was a policy in this country in the 70s and 80s. It was like a magic number. You had 65, you were no good anymore. Right? That's it. Hang it up. So we have these series of hearings around the country, and the last hearing we have is in New York City. And the head of Cartier Jewelers, now, I've never been a Cartier Jewelers, and I'm sure I never will in my lifetime, but it's a high-end jewelry store in Manhattan, right? The last witness at this hearing was the head of Cartier Jewelers and this watchmaker. Now, the testimony in this hearing, now, you've watched C-SPAN, you see how long sometimes it could take for a question and answer to happen in a congressional hearing. You know, if you need to get some sleep some night, go watch C-SPAN. That's the best way to do it, right? <laughs> He goes up to the table, there's eight members of Congress there, he puts the watch down. The question was, how much does that watch retail for? This is 1981, $45,000. Who made this watch? My colleague, how old is he? 83. You gotta write a book, right? Ability and not age. This number, I love this number, of your average age and volunteers. Length of service, eight years of being uh, in the RSVP program. And for those over 76, the average is 11 years of service. These are all great numbers, heartwarming numbers. So these two elements of trust and experience allow senior core participants to have a regular and positive impact in the communities that you work in, and especially with respect to the mental and behavioral health of your communities. So, believe it or not, people from Washington can have conclusions. And this is the last slide, so. But I went back and I read your pledge. And your pledge actually captures so much of what makes things right. Okay? When faced with a pressing challenge, I will bring Americans of all generations together to strengthen our communities. Working for the greatest good, I will use my lifetime of experience to improve my country, my community, and myself through service. But then again, Winston Churchill once said something that even was more powerful. I no longer listen to what people say. I just watch what they do. Behavior never lies. Thank you very much. Bob, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to hear you, and I still am enamored, and you can tell your wife, so. But let me tell you what, I'm 65, and I'm not ready to give up either, so let's keep moving this forward. And um, before we go to the next speaker, I do have a challenge for all of you. You heard Bob say last year for drug take back, we were in 25 states. You know if your state did it or not. So my challenge to you is, we have got to stop this crisis. And if we can be part of it, we should be in all 50 states. So I hope on October 26th of this year, Senior Corps can say we were in all 50 states for the Drug Take Back program. <laughs> Another important issue that Bob talked about is grandparents raising grandchildren. And I hope tomorrow that you're all in here for the beginning of the, or for everything, but um, I was recently in Portland, Oregon, and the American um, uh, Generations United spoke at a program they had, and 60 Minutes was there. <coughs> and they did a presentation on grandparents raising grandchildren during the opioid crisis, and we are going to open our session tomorrow with that 60 Minute session, so I hope you all can come in because it is moving. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I 
you know, we could talk all day about the impact, and I think the next person <coughs> that's presenting is you're going to have a, I'm sorry, I don't know why I choked. <coughs> um, our next perspective is going to be presented, and we talked about two perspectives on the crisis today by Mark Sanders. <coughs> Mark is an international speaker, trainer, and consultant in the field of behavioral health. His list of clients include the Ohio State University, <laughs> GM Corporation, Xerox Corporation, and all branches of the U.S. military. <coughs> he is the author of five books, and his recent work includes one on recovery management and relationships, detox, helping clients develop healthy relationships and recovery. Mark is a lecturer at the University of Chicago and has and is an alumni of Loyola University in Chicago, where he's received the Bacon Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Social Work Profession. He also received an award as Addiction Professional of the Year in Illinois, and I'm very anxious to hear him speak because I've not had that privilege, so I'm well pleased to welcome to you Mark Sanders. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Good evening. No, really. Good evening. Thank you very much. All right, so about a year ago, I'm flying in uh, from Arizona to Chicago where I live, and I'm sitting next to a man, 85 years old, uh, with six Purple Hearts. How do you get a Purple Heart? He was a World War II veteran, so he, bravery, six Purple Hearts. In other words, for three and a half hours on a flight, I'm sitting next to the bravest human being I've ever met in my life. He said, Mark, what do you do? I'm a social worker. I, I talk to people who help others for a living. A social workers, psychologists, case managers, volunteers. And he told me to tell you, thank you for your service. And there's a book I read called Good to Great. And the author's research says that no society, first they said, you can tell what's most important to a society by its tallest building. Think about it. A hundred years ago, the tallest buildings were churches. Now the tallest buildings are Fortune 500 companies and Fortune 100 companies. And the author said that no society is great just because you have tall buildings and Fortune 500 companies and Fortune 100 companies. You are great when you have great social workers and counselors and case managers and volunteers and people who help others for a living. Would you look at the person next to you and repeat this long sentence to them? This is your lucky day. You're sitting next to greatness. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. So how many of you remember a baseball player named Lou Gehrig? For those of you not raising your hand, Lou Gehrig played with the Yankees 100 years ago. He was teammates with Babe Ruth. In the 1940s, they made a movie about his life called The Pride of the Yankees. And he went in front of 40,000 screaming Yankee fans and gave the following speech. Today, that was an echo in the stadium. Today, 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 I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel like the luckiest man, 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 man on the face of this earth, 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 earth. Today, I feel like the luckiest man on the face of this earth. Who remembers that speech? How could he be lucky? He was dying. It was, a reti it was his retirement speech, his last game, and his death speech. How could he be lucky? So I went on the internet and looked at the backstory. The story that I read was that the baby, before he gave that speech, there was a little boy who was dying. Um, uh, and Lou Gehrig, first off, that speech, um, he was dying. Lou Gehrig was dying of a condition which they laid out to him, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Story had it. The day before he gave that speech, there was a 12-year-old boy in the hospital who was dying. And the boy refused to take his medication. The doctors told his mother, your son will be dead soon unless he takes his mother's medication. The mother knew that Lou Gehrig was her son's hero. So she called the Yankee organization and asked if Lou Gehrig could come to the hospital to convince her son to take his medication. So he showed up, and the boy's eyes got so big, he saw his hero, and he said, I'm still not going to take my medication <laughs> unless you hit a home run tomorrow. And Lou Gehrig said, okay, I'll hit a home run tomorrow. He didn't hit a home run. He hit two. Now fast forward. Right before he gave the speech, the mother called the Yankee organization, and word got to Lou Gehrig that her son started taking his medication. He felt fortunate and lucky because he was able to help someone. 
And you're fortunate because you help others for a living. And of course, those that you serve are fortunate because of the great work you do. So would you join me in giving your colleagues in this room a round of applause for their important work? <laughs> oh, you inspired me. 74, 72, still working. I'm still work. I'm a boomer. I'm going to keep working. You're inspirations for me for sure. Uh, by the way, just one quick one before we get into content. Um, yes, uh, correct. You want all 50 states to have that drug take back day. Let me tell you why. It's not just that you save the life of people addicted to drugs. You know, they, they, the, what they found out is that the great majority of people who die of an opiate overdose, almost 69% of people who die of an opiate overdose death, have alcohol in their system at the time of death. So visualize a person who's 71 years old, some lower back pain, and they went and had a few nightcaps and then they take the pain pill. Even if they're not addicted to chemicals, it can kill them, does that make sense? So what we're gonna talk about today is the, the link between trauma and addiction and then what I call the healing forest. So let's make that quick connection. All right, we are a nation of trauma survivors. We are a nation of trauma survivors. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. I imagine that some of you in this room may be the descendants of African slaves. Trauma. Um, anyone in this room um, have an ancestor that was an indentured servant? Let me make this kind of interesting to you. When I was in North Carolina, and by the way, indentured servants were people that were in Europe, in prison, allowed to come to the New World, America, to work off their jail sentence by doing seven years of slave labor. So I'm in North Carolina, and I ask the question, where are the descendants of the indentured servants? And people raise their hand and say, you're looking at them. By the way, quickly, during that period of chattel slavery, in many ways, what I've read is that the indentured servants were more brutal towards those who were enslaved than those who owned the slaves because traumatized people, traumatized people. Native Americans, several hundred years of torture, the highest alcoholism rate in the world. Here's where it gets interesting. Columbus came to America in 16, was it 42? 1492? With three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Now, it sounds real good, right? Did you know he never set foot on U.S. soil? In fact, you know why he named the people Indian? Because he was lost. Thought he was in India. I just read a book recently that said between South America and Central America, they estimate that 70 million people died in that, what they call a Holocaust themselves, from the moment that, that, that Christopher Columbus set foot in the Americas. Now, does anyone um, know what Native Americans call uh, Columbus Day? Indigenous People Day and a National Day of Mourning. So when you have that kind of trauma, you have heavy drinking. Is that making sense? All right, now, how many of you come from a family that came to the America via Ellis Island a few hundred years ago? Okay, so my question is, what's the reason they came to America? What's that opportunity? So what opportunity didn't exist where they were, when they were where they originally from? What better jobs, and where? Italy, okay, and then we saw a hand here. Poland, and what was happening in Poland so that they came here. You said freedom? Freedom here. Because my friends, I studied what was happening in Poland. Hitler took them over. Stalin took them over. That was a lot of trauma. Anyone else? Family came over a few hundred years ago. From where? And what's the reason they came? Famine, right? Poverty, right? Potato famine. So here's the most common thing I've heard. Those of you in this room whose family came here via Ellis Island, they were either escaping a war, Poverty, famine, the Holocaust, et cetera. We are a nation of trauma survivors. And that's the first important point I'd like to make. Wars are traumatic. You know, our first big war was the American Revolutionary War. And there's a book that's called The Alcoholic Republic. And the author's research indicates that Americans drank more alcohol per capita the first 40 years after signing the Declaration of Independence than any time in our nation's history. That would be 1776 to 1806. As much as people drink now, they drank more then. They didn't have happy hour back then. They didn't have women can drink for a quarter on Thursday night. They didn't drink, they didn't have like tailgating at the Buckeyes games. Why did they drink so much back then? 1776 to 1806. They said the British had all the tea. 
They didn't have bottled water, so water was impure. They didn't have refrigeration in 1776, so milk spoiled easily. They said that Starbucks was too expensive <laughs> because we were in a war over taxation without representation. A lot of trauma, a lot of terror, a lot of drinking. You know who was most concerned about all the drinking amongst men and boys following the war? Were the wives. Martha Washington was very concerned. She started what was called the temperance movement. So a typical scene during the war was women waking up their houses on a Sunday morning in 1881 and saying, let's go to church. And they would have these husbands put their hands on the Bible and make a pledge that they would either switch from whiskey to beer or drink less whiskey. <laughs> Did the temperance movement succeed? Because they never addressed the nightmares and the terror from the war. Is that making sense? All right. Um, I went and looked at the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments of the U.S. Constitution from a trauma lens, and they represent everything a trauma. This is a trauma document, in my opinion. They represent the first 10 amendments of the U.S. Constitution, everything a trauma survivor would need to feel safe following a war. The first being the freedom of speech. So what do trauma survivors need more than to talk? Every girl I've ever worked with that was sexually abused, someone in the family took away her First Amendment right. This is horrible what your father did to you. But if you tell they'll put your father in prison and we will become homeless. Her First Amendment right has been taken away. She's getting high every day. Does that make sense? The Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is the, free, the right to bear arms. For what does a trauma survivor need more than to feel safe? Number three, you don't have to let soldiers live in your house. Um, nobody can search your body or your house unless they can prove to a judge there's a good reason to do so. How many of you, by show of hands, receive 12 hugs a day? A little hug deprivation in the room, huh? Okay. <laughs> how do you get 12 hugs a day? You have 10, how many? You got 10 children? How, how do you get 12 a day? Love until you're old. Now, I've been at, who else gets 12? 12 a day? How? You know, I travel the country asking people if they get 12 hugs a day, and no one has ever said their spouse. Any of y'all get hugs from your spouse? <laughs> who gets a hug from your spouse? Okay, how long have you been married? 34 years. You all still hug each other? My wife can't stand me. My wife can't stand me. I told her I'll be in Columbus two days. She said, stay three. I'm not Bob. I'm not Bob, my friends. All right, so what I want to tell you that I share with the other group is that trauma lodges itself in the body. The brain can forget the body remembers, right? And so something happens, and we're ready to, like, bear arms because trauma lodges itself in the human body. All right, Civil War 1861-1865. During the Civil War, soldiers were giving a pint of alcohol per day to deal with the trauma of war. That is our link, whether we're talking about a five-year-old boy who was sexually abused or coming back from war, there's a strong link between substance use and trauma. So how many of you believe that unemployment is traumatic? Turn to the person next to you and tell them what was happening in your life in 1986. Take a moment to talk about 1986. Okay. All right, so is there anyone here that wasn't born in 1986? Okay, what year were you born? 89. He was born last night. What year were you born? 99? You kidding? I got shoes older than you. What year were you born? 87. All right, all right. Now, in 1986, June 13th, there was a basketball player named Lim Bias. He was the second coming of Michael Jordan. They said the limb bias jumped so high, if he went in the, in the air on a Monday, when he came down, it was Tuesday. <laughs> People are still debating who's better, Michael or, 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 or Lynn Bias. The night he was drafted number one by the Boston Celtics, he was going to team with Larry Bird. Had that guy team with Larry Bird, I live in Chicago, the Bulls would not have won those six championships. <laughs> the day he was drafted, June of 1986, Number one, by the Celtics, he had a heart attack. He went and snorted some cocaine, had a heart attack and died. And um, Congress intensified the war on drugs. We went from uh, 400,000 inmates in our nation's prison to 2.5 million. As the stigma increased, so did incarceration. 
They went from individuals with illnesses and diseases like Betty Ford. My name is Betty Ford. I'm an alcoholic to a bad person. But what we also learned is that the same time that crack cocaine hit urban America, 1986, was the same time when jobs were being shipped away. Look at what's happening in rural America. As jobs are being shipped away, opiates and, and stimulants like methamphetamines are taking over. So it reads, life expectancy of rural America has dropped as jobs continue to disappear. The leading causes of death include cirrhosis, you know, heavy drinking, and suicide, you know, heavy drinking, and opiate overdose deaths. So th 37 years I've been an alcohol and drug counselor. We work with individuals. That's not good enough. So actually, Bob and I have one speech because we're thinking systemically. There's a Native American named Don Coyas, and there he is, that started a program called White Bison. And he was from a tribe, and he got sober and felt pessimism because 65% of his tribe was still drinking. So he went to New Mexico and met with the elders. And the elders said that there's going to be a sign that it's time for our people to recover from alcoholism. A white buffalo will be born, born somewhere in the United States. And a few months later, in a city called Janesville, Wisconsin, anybody here from Wisconsin? A white buffalo was born. So he started a program called White Bison, where they're helping Native Americans as we speak. By mobilizing the entire tribes, they're putting together 50 and 60 percent recovery rates. It's like a secret what happens when people come together. So here's what Don Coya said. The treatment of addiction is similar to digging up a sick and dying tree, transplanting it into rich soil, sunshine, water, and fertilizer for 28 days. That's kind of how we treat addiction. Are you with me? Um, only to return to the same sick soil that it left and watching you get sick again. Don Coya says, we must treat the soil, uh, we must treat the soil which starts with viewing the entire community as a recovery center. Not the individual program, but the entire community. So a question I have people to ask their communities is what hidden resources exist within the community that can be part of a healing forward to support recovery? And these things are in every community. Families. Does anyone know the immigrant group, the immigrant group, or the group that migrated to the, to the, America, to the United States, according to sociologists, that attained success the quickest? Of all the groups who achieved success the quickest, that have migrated to the United States? Take a guess at it. Okay. They do well, don't they? <laughs> so do the Asians. They study, I swear. Fidel Castro got tired of America letting all the Cubans come in. So he emptied the mental health facilities and the prisons and sent them over to Florida, thinking that once they came, we wouldn't want any other Cubans here. The Coast Guard was there. And they saw people showing up at the shores. There were Cuban citizens from Florida said, you can go home, we've got this. They took them in. And when the families took them in, they achieved success faster than any other group, according to sociologists in history. Families are amazing what they can do when they work together. Treatment centers, faith-based organizations, how many of you live in a community with a mega church? I know some communities that have these really large churches. The churches are actually paying for the, tr the treatment of drug addiction by taking up one Sunday collection just for the churches. There's a church that's called Saddleback Church in Colorado, a pastor by the name of Rick Warren. They provide like recovery support within cities. It's the, one of the fastest growing recovery movements in the United States. Other social service organizations, people in long-term recovery, the formerly incarcerated, employers. Let me share with you one thing that Portugal does better than we do. In America, when a trauma survivor becomes an opiate um, addicted person to cope with their trauma, we give them what's called a felony arrest. Here's the problem. A felony arrest, <clears throat> as we speak, carries longer term consequences than being a drug addict. Because you're a drug addict, you can always get sober. That felony has a way of following you for a long time. Portugal had a president that was addicted to heroin. He got sober and passed some laws that said that if an employer hires somebody seeking recovery, they'll get tax breaks. 
And they're bringing their op op opiate overdose deaths almost down to like um, minuscule. Concerned citizens and volunteers, you can pull a community together. Bob said it though, the one thing it takes is trust. It's to be able to pull a community together and say, hey, let's work on this, not individually, but collectively. So anybody here from Indiana, Scott County, Indiana, close to Kentucky, you see the sign the health department said free HIV testing. Here's what happened. Scott County, Indiana is a town of 4,000 residents. Industry left. People responded to industry leaving by using heroin and sharing needles. The end result of that is 400 residents that they knew of tested positive for HIV. It was seen as a public health emergency. The entire community came together to address the challenge. The whole community came together. The end result is that recovery support groups led by peers increased from 1 uh, to 18, from 30 people to 330. Uh, 37 recovery coaches were hired and trained to provide recovery support in emergency rooms. New cases of HIV decreased from 154 in 2015 uh, to 8 in 2017. There's a volunteer in my town, Chicago, that has approached the recovery homes with people who are in recovery, many with felony arrest, and says, I will help you figure out how to seek a career in the construction industry. He's helped 3,000 people get hired in construction. There's a, a Canadian Indian group called the Alkali Lake Tribe. I wish we had more time, and we don't. They went from 100% alcohol to 95% recovery, and they maintained it for 40 years. The whole tribe came together to fight for this. If I ruled the world, every addictions program in this country would have a relationship with a community college. I believe that most of the coal mining jobs are not coming back, but community colleges, they're practical. And they have those skills that you can't outsource abroad. Go to a party and ask a man who he is, he'll tell you what he does. When we lose our jobs, we start getting high. We leave families. Women start getting high, et cetera. We need to get restaurants involved. Let me skip this one right here and go right here. A group of ex-offenders knew that it was hard for ex-offenders to get jobs. So in my town, Chicago, a group of ex-offenders came together and opened a restaurant called Felony Franks. And they hired nothing but ex-offenders. Look at the menu. I've had the warden special, it's the real deal. How many of you have ever gone to Las Vegas? Oh, I see. That's how you become a manager, huh? Well, the five of you who've never gone, you need to go. Because Vegas is living proof of what a criminal can do if you give them a chance. I've gone every year for 11 straight years at a conference in Vegas. And uh, last time I went to Vegas, I'm at the airport, can't wait to get back home to Chicago. And the announcement came over the loudspeaker. Your plane has been delayed. I'm angry. But instead of focusing my anger that the plane is delayed, I played the slot machines at the airport while I waited. <laughs> I won $1.7 million. Just kidding. <laughs> Bob said, really? I don't even gamble. I don't like the odds. I'm kind of like Sam Cooke. If I ever get my hands on a dollar again, I'm going to hold on to the Eagle Grins. Anyway, my next stop was to a small town called Galena, Illinois. And Galena is the opposite of Vegas. No roulette wheels, no, no noise, just you and your thoughts, crickets and stars. I came back from that small town really replenished, ready to take on the world. Norman Vincent Peale says that busy people like you who help others for a living, it's mandatory for you to spend at least 15 minutes alone each day just to replenish yourself. And you have that much more to offer the world. So in the midst of trying to, oh, doing the work to save the world, we have to make time, sure that we have some time for replenishment. Our time is getting really, really short. All right. So the, the one thing I'm suggesting to you is that you don't have to work in the field to make the difference. All you need is creative ideas. That's what we need is creative ideas. If we had the solutions, People who do this work like me would have it figured out. No, we need creative ideas. We need whole communities working together. My mentor's mentor was dying. And he called my mentor and asked my mentor, 
Would you fly from, Cal from Florida, where my mentor lived, to Kalamazoo, Michigan, and sit near my bedside and help me write one more article before I die? My mentor got on the plane in Florida and flew to Kalamazoo. He's sitting near his mentor's bedside and says, man, I got to tell you, this is really strange. You have written 400 articles. You have revolutionized behavioral health of your pen. Why are you writing this article? His mentor quoted that philosopher that said, the philosopher said, each of us dies twice. He said, the first time you die, it's a physical death. They'll have a funeral for you. And the next time you die, it's the last time someone on earth speaks your name. And if you keep helping people, there'll be people speaking your name for a long time. Thank you very much for allowing me to spend this time with you. Thank you. There's really not too many words that can follow that. <laughs> so let's all work every day so when the time comes, somebody speaks our name. Happy hour has started and this session is over. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> <laughs>